To draw the Lewis structure for CH4, we first draw the Lewis symbols for each of them, so for a carbon and a hydrogen. So carbon, we would look at our periodic table, and carbon has four dots, one on each side. And hydrogen, we know, has one dot. Not only are we told that there are four hydrogen atoms and one carbon, but we can see here that this hydrogen would love to share an electron with that one carbon valence electron. And then there's three others that need to share. One hydrogen atom would love to share with this guy, and another hydrogen would love to share with that one, and another with that one. And when we're done, the carbon obtains an octet, and each hydrogen is complete with two shared electrons. Here's what it would look like. Notice that the carbon has eight electrons around it, and each hydrogen appears to have the two, just like helium. We can also represent it like this, with single lines between the carbon atom and each of the hydrogen atoms. In addition to Lewis structures, 3D models can be used to represent molecular compounds. You already saw a picture of a ball and stick model, which shows the shape of a molecule using spheres for atoms and sticks as bonding electron pairs. And then there's the space filling model. The atoms are shown as partial spheres and are proportional to the real size of the atoms because the bonds are within the filled spaces, they're not visible. Let's look at a couple examples. Methane, or CH4, you already saw the Lewis structure, and then using dashed lines instead of the dots. Here's a ball and stick model for methane, and then there's the space filling model. Here's ammonia, NH3. Notice that it looks similar to CH4, except for there's not a fourth H. And the reason why there's not a fourth H is because nitrogen has five outermost electrons. If we looked at the periodic table at nitrogen, it's in the fifth family. Now that dot doesn't have to be on the top. We could have that fifth dot on the side. And then we would have a hydrogen bonded there, a hydrogen here, and a hydrogen here. It doesn't matter if it's exactly like that. It could have its lone pairs on the bottom or on the left. And then we have water, H2O, oxygen, we know has six outermost electrons. It's a little deceiving when you look at it like this. But if I did piece by piece, one, two, three, four, five, six, we could see that there's a perfect spot for a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. And that gives me my H2O. When we draw a Lewis structure for a molecule or a polyatomic ion, we show the sequence of atoms, the bonding pairs of electrons that's shared between atoms, and the non-bonding, or the lone pairs of electrons. If we look back to our NH3, this top two dots are our non-bonding electrons. With water, we have two sets of non-bonding electrons. And from the formula, we can identify the central atom. The central atom is the element that has fewer atoms. If I look back at CH4, the element that has fewer atoms is carbon. That's our central atom. NH3, there's one nitrogen and three hydrogens. N is our central atom. H2O, there's two H's and one O. The O is our central atom because there's fewer of them. Pause the video here and try to draw the Lewis structure for PCl3. The first thing is we want to determine the arrangement of the atoms. There's one P and there's three chlorines. So the P will be our central atom. Now we need to figure out how many dots do each of these have. I'm going to look at the periodic table for phosphorus. Phosphorus is right here. It has five valence electrons. Chlorine has seven. Let's draw phosphorus as five. One, two, three, four. Doubled up on one side is five. Each chlorine has seven, and I arranged it so the one electron of chlorine that did not have a pair was close to the P. We can see that these will bond, those will bond, and those will bond. It's important that while doing this that we make sure that we have the right number of total valence electrons that's being shown in our drawing. To do that, we just said that phosphorus had five valence electrons, and there's one phosphorus, so that's five electrons there, and there's three chlorines. Each chlorine has seven valence electrons, so seven times three is 21. Add them up, there should be 26 total electrons. Let's check. There's two, four, six, eight around the phosphorus, including all of the shared ones from the chlorines, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 
22, 24, 26. There's 26 electrons in that drawing. Be careful when you're drawing. It's easy to do this. P and then CL, 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 bond, 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 and call it quits. So it's easy to have something to look like this. But always go back and double check your electrons. This drawing right here is only showing two, four, six electrons. But wait a minute, we just said we have to have 26 electrons. So it's fine to start off by putting your P, your central P, and putting your chlorines around it and bonding them for those six. But then we need to go back and fill in all of those other electrons. Because again, two, four, six electrons is nowhere near 26 electrons. We want to go in and make sure to put those lone electrons around the chlorines. And even if we stopped there, we if let's say you forgot about these up here. If you counted, that would be 8, 16, 24 electrons. We need 26. Phosphorus, if I didn't have those two electrons above P, phosphorus would only have 2, 4, 6 electrons. We know phosphorus wants 8. That's why those two electrons up here are important. It gives it its octet. Here's one. Draw a Lewis structure for sodium chloride, which is a component of mouthwashes, toothpaste, and contact lens cleaning solutions. The compound is ClO2 with a negative one charge. See if you can put that together. Well, first things first, let's arrange our atoms. There's one chlorine and two oxygens. So since there's one chlorine, let's put it in the center. And our two oxygens, I'm just going to put on either side of it because we know electrons repel each other. So these two O's aren't going to want to be close to one another. And we know that after we're done arranging our electrons, it's going to have a negative one charge. Next, let's do an electron count to make sure that we can account for all the electrons in this compound. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. Each oxygen has six, so six times two is 12. And it has a negative one charge, which means it gained one electron. So I'm gonna add another electron to that. So 12 plus seven is 19 plus one is 20 electrons that we need to draw. So we can't just go like this and call it good. That would only be four electrons. But what we can do is we can now go back and fill in lone pairs of electrons. Again, this is four. One, two, three, four. All right, I put in six electrons for this oxygen, and then that bond would give it eight. So we've got eight, nine, 10 electrons so far. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That gives us 20 electrons. Now let's make sure that everybody's happy with eight. Two, four, six, eight for oxygen. Two, four, six, eight for chlorine and let's look at this oxygen two four six eight for that oxygen and again i'm going to double check that we have 20 electrons two four six eight ten twelve fourteen sixteen eighteen twenty and there we go this is what our compound should look like up to now we have looked at bonding and molecules having only single bonds in many molecular compounds, atoms share two or three pairs of electrons to complete their octets. Double and triple bonds form when the number of valence electrons is not enough to complete the octets of all of the atoms in the molecule. Then, one or more lone pairs of electrons from the atoms attached to the central atom are shared with the central atom. Atoms of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur are most likely to form multiple bonds. Atoms of hydrogen and the halogens do not form double or triple bonds. In a single bond, one pair of electrons is shared, and we show that with a single line. You know, a single line represents two electrons to form one bond. In a double bond, we would show that as two lines. In a double bond, has one, two, three, four electrons involved in that bond. A triple bond is three pairs of electrons shared, and we would show it like this. That would be one, two, three, four, five, six electrons involved in that bond. Let's look at a compound, carbon dioxide. The central atom is C. There's one carbon and two oxygens. So let's do our one carbon and two oxygens. We'll put it in a linear fashion for now. Let's do our electron count. We know each carbon has four outermost electrons. Each oxygen has six, so six times two is 12. 
So 12 plus 4, we've got to have 16 electrons in this compound. I'm going to start by just putting one bond in between these two. That's 1, 2, 3, 4 electrons. Now I'm going to do lone pairs. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That's 16 electrons in this compound. And if I look, oxygen's happy on the left, 2, 4, 6, 8. This oxygen on the right is happy, 2, 4, 6, 8. But what's wrong here? Poor carbon is not happy. Carbon only has two, four electrons, and carbon really wants eight. In order to give carbon eight, one of our lone pairs of oxygen, let's just say this top one, it could be the bottom one or the side one, it doesn't matter, but one of the lone pairs of oxygen is going to share that lone pair right here and form a double bond. There already was one bond, but the lone pair here is going to give to share and then one of these lone pairs on the left oxygen is going to do the same thing and share those right there. So I'm going to redraw this. My oxygen on the left now only has two sets of lone pairs and then it's sharing that one lone pair with the carbon and then the second oxygen on the right again only has two sets of lone pairs because it shared one of its lone pairs. Now let's do our count. We have two, four, six, eight. This oxygen's happy with eight. This carbon has two, four, six, eight. And this oxygen on the right has two, four, six, eight. Everybody has an octet now. Here's the ball and stick model showing the double bond. Here's our space filling model. The last piece to this section are some exceptions to the octet rule. Although the octet rule is useful for bonding in many, many compounds, there are some exceptions. A hydrogen molecule, H2, requires just two electrons or a single bond. It's not going to ever have eight, and we won't form double bonds. In BCl3, the boron atom has only three valence electrons to share. Boron compounds typically have six valence electrons on the central boron and form only three bonds not four. Boron is happy with six, not eight. Although we will generally see compounds of phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, and iodine with octets, they can form molecules in which they share more electrons. This expands their valence electrons to 10, 12, or even 14 electrons. The P atom in PCl3 has an octet, but in PCl5, the phosphorus atom has five bonds. The P is central, and then there's five chlorines coming out of that phosphorus. Therefore, that phosphorus has 10 valence electrons. In H2S, the S atom has an octet, but in SF6, I have a central S with six fluorines coming out of it. Therefore, since it has six bonds, there are 12 valence electrons for that sulfur. Here's showing us boron boron with three chlorines around it. So each chlorine has an octet, but boron is fine, only having two, four, six coming out of it. Here's one showing SF6. We have a central sulfur, and we have six fluorines coming out of that sulfur. Here is our review. Take a minute to look over our learning goal.